Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I am delighted to be chatting today with Anthony Mann, who if you haven't heard of, you should have. Anthony is a senior policy analyst with the Directorate for Education and Skills at the OECD. And late last year, Anthony and his colleagues released a phenomenal report on career readiness. Um, and I find myself lately in a lot of conversations about career readiness that are um, policymakers and researchers and funders thinking about ways to modernize our concept of career readiness. And what Anthony's report really does that we're gonna talk about today is I think get under the hood of the research behind career readiness at an international level. So Anthony, I just wanna start off, thanks for joining. Um, I know it's a little later where you are across the pond, but um, this paper was a massive undertaking. Uh, and for those who don't have time to read all beautiful and super interesting 138 pages. What did the report set out to do? All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. And thanks for the opportunity to um, come and join the blog. Um, I would say that um, um, just this week, we, we're, we're kind of publishing um, a short version, kind of like a version for guidance, which is Wonderful. called um, How Schools Can Help Protect Young People in a Recession. And it kind of does what it says in the tin, really. Um, we're kind of very much aware that young people uh, are already sort of like struggling in the labour market. And, you know, we're, we're, everybody's expecting um, there to be a recession to follow the pandemic. And in that economic turn, turn down, we expect young people to really suffer. And we kind of saw it in the great financial crash of 2007, 2008. And, and then we kind of saw across the OECD, the kind of the, it took 10 years for youth unemployment rates to get back to where they were in 2006. You know, yeah. it's, you know, young people always suffer and they suffer because, you know, they um, have left experience of the workplace. Um, they suffer because they, um, they don't know how to get a job. They've got their weaker social networks. And even though often they're, they're more highly qualified than older workers mm. and they're cheaper often than older workers, we see them consistently losing out. And we're frustrated by that because we're very much aware there are things which schools can do and aren't doing to, um, to improve the career readiness of young people. And so, so in this paper, which we published, um, which we call Career Ready, uh, with a question mark um, in December, what we looked at was, you know, what, what, what really hard evidence is there of yeah. um, teenage attitudes and experiences, which can be related to better than expected employment outcomes in, um, in young adulthood in, in, in their twenties. And so, you know, we're really interested in national longitudinal data sets. And so these are surveys which, um, which first interview young people and their parents and their teachers while they're in childhood. And then every few years they go back and interview them again and again and then into adulthood. And these are, these are the sorts of data sets which people use to work out whether childhood illnesses are related to adult illnesses or childhood environment is related. But through it, we can actually make a, uh, we can also find out a lot about educational experiences. And what we did is what, you know, when initially we kind of did a very big review of, um, you know, kind of the literature around using these, um, these national um, longitudinal databases in the US, uh, particularly in Australia and the UK, they're the three countries where we've done the most, um, most on this. And what we find is that you can, you can kind of cluster together kind of some of the positive results where things which happen in childhood, which related to career thinking, career experiences, actually lead somebody to think better than you would expect. And yep. by that, I mean, they do better than you'd expect to somebody with that level of qualification and from that social background, because we still live in a world where social background has a big impact on how well people do in the labor market. And you know, what, we, what we found was that we could cluster um, um, these positive results into three areas. Now, the first one's about you know, how people think about the future. Yeah. Without like, saying a word to anyone, just by what you think about the future mm. is on average connected with better or worse outcomes. And so an example would be uncertainty. You know, if at 15, a young person can't name a job they expect to do you know, in their 20s or 30s, you know, um, we call them uncertain. Uncertainty has increased a lot in recent years in most countries. Mm -hmm. And we find that on average, young people do worse. There's a, there's a very easy test, which is called misalignment. You ask a young person what job they expect to do. You ask them what, um, what's the highest level of education they expect to get. If their education is lower than is required for the yep. occupation, typically, they're misaligned and they do worse. And we find an yep. awful lot of kids are, are misaligned. An awful lot of kids, um, particularly from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, are misaligned. It's an indication of confusion. So we've got three areas. The first one's about thinking about the future. The second is a series of indicators around exploring the future. And here um, we have um, career development activities, career guidance activities, 
um, kind of vocational exploration, but also really interesting career conversations, mm -hmm. um, which is simply we ask a question, which is, um, have you talked to anybody about a job you expect to do later on? You'd expect everybody to say yes, but that's not the case. You know, about 20 to 30 percent of kids in different countries haven't spoken to anybody. Yeah. The more disadvantaged you are, the lower the achiever you are, um, the less likely it is that you, 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 you will speak to anybody. And we find from our, our national longitudinal data sets that, you know, simply asking, saying yes to that question as a teenager, I have spoken to somebody, mm. is connected with better outcomes than you would expect if you compare the two. And then finally, we've got, we've sort of got thinking, we've got exploring, we've got experiencing. And yeah. what we find is that, you know, kind of volunteering, internships, um, uh, part-time working, you know, are all associated with better than expected outcomes on average. And so there are these series of indicators, which for us are, um, are, really, are really useful to understand and be aware of as you're designing programs to support young people, because it's really hard to know what works in, in kind of career guidance, yeah. because give them the intervention and it's really, I don't know, you know, one year, two year, 10 years later. Years out, yeah. Work. But we do have some evidence and that evidence actually fits with the theory of change yeah. which is that young people who think about it more, who explore it more, who experience more, are being um, equipped to be more, um, to show greater sense of agency, to be more critical yep. thinkers about the relationship between education and employment. And you know, we find that, you know, that these relationships hold even in a, even in a recession. We found that mm. you know, the generation which grew up around the last Great Recession, you know, there is an advantage for doing it. And we can't, we can't create lots of jobs to it, but we can right. make sure that young people have the best possible opportunity to compete for available work in a difficult labor market. Yeah, so important and so critical. I think um, we, you talk about a recession, but also the ingredients to a an, an more equitable and productive economic recovery, right? Um, so let's actually get, get one layer deeper into these three around thinking exploring and experiencing, which really resonate. And I think um, many folks in the US talking about career readiness, I think these are all sort of floating around, but your framework gives some precision <laughs> to a set of activities that are actually quite popular in, in both high schools and colleges, but may not be framed quite as crisply as what you just laid out. Um, the thing I wanna just not shockingly dig into within these three is the notion of social capital. Um, listeners know that this is something that we at the Christensen Institute are studying really closely. How might high schools and post-secondary institutions and even middle schools be more purposeful about brokering the sorts of social capital that expand young people's career options? Um, and so uh, maybe you can zero in on, on some of the ways that social capital uh, was an important variable, and I should clarify for listeners, social capital being whom you know, the sorts of relationships you have access to, the people that you're having those conversations and experiences with. Um, how does that shape career aspiration? Because we know it matters when you go out to get a job. That's like indisputable. But before that, I'm actually seeking a job, everything leading up to that. Why does social capital matter or appear to matter in the research you looked at? Um, well, firstly, we, we, one one thing which we you know which we discovered and won't won't be won't, won't be won't be um, front page news to lots of people but um, it was you know it's, it's kind of slightly different to evidence difficult to evidence is that kind of the career aspirations of young people are distorted by mm. their gender by their uh, migrant status and by their social background and we can we can prove that because. Uh, we, run, we run PISA, the Programme for International Student Assessment. So every three years, uh, more than half a million 15-year-olds around the world, they do these standardised tests. And from that, we, we can learn a lot about their academic um, levels, their academic proficiency. And we kind of know that, you know, our tests are good guides because we followed generations through in the past to see how well they do. And we, we kind of know that they're, you know, they're good indications. We also ask them lots of questions about you know, where their career interests lie. Um, we ask them about their social background, about you know, the family background. And when we kind of see very consistently that, you know, controlling for their, you know, kind of their academic ability, we find very different interests in terms of um, what young people um, aspire to do in terms of work. And that's important because they are actually making real decisions as they go through education about, not just about you know, um, what subject to opt into or um, you know, a special speciality to choose, but just how hard they're gonna work on different subjects as they go through. Um, through Their schooling. investment sort of. In the Their investment, exactly. And so, you know, and so that, that kind of comes through from that, kind of their social profiles. 
you know, we kind of know they can work through migrant status, it can work with social background. And so, you know, that comes from kind of the interactions which people have um, with, with, with the community. Um, but the, the thing which I, you know, there's, there's a couple of things here. One is, you know, I mentioned this, this, this point around career conversations. Yeah. And, you know, and, and in 2018, uh, in, in Pisa, we asked kids for the first time, have you had a conversation with somebody about a job you expect to do when you leave education? Mm. And we find, as I say, quite a lot, you know, quite a lot of variation. And that variation is linked to, you know, people's social characteristics. And we find the more disadvantaged you are, you know, less access, you know, you have to, you know, kind of this is a resource. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite shocking, really. And it kind of links to, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a, I, th I think, I think social capital is hugely important in this area. Because um, it links to a series of studies which have looked at the way in which you know young people have gained access to resources of value as they've gone through their transitions, and there's a you know there's there's a really good um, um, study of it of a longitudinal survey in the UK, and it it, it kind of follows kids um, at, at 15, 16, who had mm -hmm. um, talks from pe from people from outside of school about careers. You know, so we kind of imagine that these might be uh, kind of volunteers talking about what it's sure. like to be a firefighter or to be a farmer or, or so. On. And and then we follow them 10 years later and we kind of find that the you know, the more interaction which they had, the more talks which they had, the bigger the wage premium that they experienced later on. Mm -hmm. You know, and we kind of find that um, if at the time they said it was very useful, you know, so at 15 and 16, did you have any career talks? Were they helpful to you? I say, yes, they were. I get a bigger premium late, later on. Mm. And that fits with um, some of the kind of the theorizations of Mark Granovetta. Yeah. You know, kind of the idea about the strength of weak ties, which I'm sure many of your, you know, your network will, you know, can be very familiar with. But what what, what he what he said, Granovetta said, who's a professor at Stanford, you know, kind of he he argued that, you know, kind of what young people have is uh, you know, they have to often have quite a narrow set of resources about them, you know, so they, they might know sort of like, you know, maybe a lot of people, those people often tend to know the same thing. And so to get ahead in work, what you need to have is like a very broad network, like yeah. lots of different people and lots of different stuff. And this is one of the great things that schools can do. They can be a real agent for democratizing yeah. access to useful information. And so Granovetta would call it um, non-redundant trusted information. You know, I call yeah. it new and useful. You know, so through the more sort of like career talks, interventions you have through your school, you know, with your employer, the more opportunity you have to learn something new. And, and if I think you see that person, so I just finish off, if you see yeah. that person's being really authentic, mm -hmm. then you know they're not trying to sell you anything. And then, you know, it's kind of really help, you know, you can learn an awful lot very quickly. And the evidence shows that, you know, kind of young people um, do gain later on in the labor market, but it's not a real sense of, sort of social capital. It's a kind of like a proxy. Because yes. they're not real friends forever, but the school enables it. And that's a brilliant thing that schools can do, but they don't always do. It's such an elegant example, Anthony. And I just, I love how you're breaking it down. Um, if you think about um, sort of traditional approaches and traditional schools all over our country right now, um, there's a notion of bringing in guest speakers, right? This is not a this is an innovation in the sense of like someone just invented the notion of a guest speaker coming to talk to a class, either to sort of inspire relevance, uh, to give a guest lecture, or to sort of give feedback to students. But what you've isolated here in your study that I think is so powerful is that that relatively simple and affordable intervention is doable and can have an impact. Um, and what I wanna double click on here that has been missing, I think in a lot of our conversations around career exposure through volunteers, through guest speakers, all of this, is that idea of authenticity. And the idea that you, it would be um, remiss, I think, for schools to sort of flood the zone with as many of these career talks as possible and hope to see wage premiums go up and up and up, but that you can have, um, you know, a modest number of these career talks with an eye on authenticity and quality, and they can be high quality even though they are brief. And I think that doesn't always click in the education system here at least where we think of all relationships being long and enduring in order to be high quality and have an impact. Um, so just to translate what you just shared, I think this notion of um, conversation happening in a bounded and deliberate way is, is a really powerful and doable <laughs> um, intervention for for school yeah. systems. I mean, Go ahead. I, I think the, I think the phrase to have in, in, in your mind is that a lot of a little, you know, really does mm. go a long way. Um, and I think that sometimes it's throwing mud at a wall. 
because you don't know what's going to stick. Yeah. You know, like surveys show us that um, teenagers often have um, secret aspirations, which they won't share with anybody. You know, mm. often they don't know what they don't know, you know. Um, and so it's really important to, you know, to give them a lot of exposure. But the authenticity is abs absolutely essential. You know, and, it, and, I, and I think it's the authenticity which, which underpins the quality. That, yeah, um, exactly. That, that when a student sees somebody talking, they need to think that they know what they're talking about. And so if they said to somebody, well, actually, somebody like you'd be really good at this if you're, you know, a big character or if you um, love working with people, you know, um, or you might find it difficult because you really need to have really strong maths in this in, in this area. Right. You know, that's worth so much more. And and what, what one of the things we need to keep in mind is that um, it, it's kind of very possible during this era of lockdowns and social distancing to be able to put some of these, um, you know, kind of this is a very simple thing which we can do online. Yeah. But I'd say so far, you know, go for volume. Ask the kids if they found it useful or not. If they did it, yeah. well, that's something which will find useful, you know? Yep. And exactly. give them something which they, and make them do it. That's my other piece of advice because, you know, because mm -hmm. they've got these attitudes and assumptions which have come from their, often from their social background or, you know, about things which is right for, you know, what girls to do or right for people from my background to do. And, you know, they make it, you know, and they rule things out and they rule things in. And what yeah. we want them to do is have a, a more of an open mind. And, yep. be, and I would start this at middle school, you know, and, yep. and even sort of like even younger, um, you know, be exposing young people to people in work so they can help draw the connection between what happens in a classroom and what will happen in a workplace. And quickly, um, before we get into sort of the, this notion of career experience, because I think it's getting a lot of traction here in the US um, in the upskilling conversation, I want to dive into that. But quickly, in a couple sentences, can you delineate what you think of as a career conversation versus a career talk? Those are two terms that come up in your report. Sure, that's right. Um, so career talk is, is kind of very much like a guest speaker, as you describe it. Um, it's um, somebody who will come into a classroom to talk about the job they do, you know, two kids. Um, it might be quite short, you might have 20 minutes, you know, you might have two or three in an hour. Uh, but that's the idea. And incidentally, um, for, for career talks, um, you know, what, what, what I've seen is that um, a career carousel model works really well. You know, where you have like uh, maybe maybe six, seven volunteers on tables. Like speed get, dating, get, kind of. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That works brilliantly because the kids grow in confidence. They have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, you know, it's very hard, hard for them to hide if they're doing it maybe in two mm. or threes or ones, you know, to be able to get that interaction. Um, you know, the authenticity sort of like screams, screams out. So think about career carousels if you're doing that. I think you get the, the extra value from it. Great, Whereas great. a career conversation is, you know, it's simply, you know, as, as it suggests, it's, you know, have you, have you talked to anybody? Are you talking so, to anybody? Yeah. Uh, and you know the, the I mean what we find is that from you know if looking at US and looking at you can I say UK Australian um, in particular um, um, studies is that you know um, if you have a conversation with a teacher it seems to have particularly good value um, often you know we find that there's one study where uh, if a young person says that their idea for a career came from a conversation with a teacher we see them doing better later on but what mm. you know they're kind of accessing you know kind of this new and useful information because teachers know stuff and you know they're sharing it with kids and it's not just teachers you know we want to encourage lots of conversations because we want ultimately what we want them is to have this sense of agency you know so, you know kind of we want to become critical thinkers about who they are and you know and who they might become you know what they need to do yeah. to achieve it, what the barriers might be what it might be like if they're a non-traditional person in that in, in, in that in that workplace but to be critically thinking and that comes from conversations and come from discussions and it comes from an, an openness and I think that's where the, the best career systems in the world, you know, really encourage and enable that. Great, super helpful. So I think there's two, two different modalities that both have an upside, um, but one is a little bit more actually in that sort of exposure bucket of just a lot of exposure if you do speed dating with a bunch of volunteers, as opposed to I'm having a conversation where I'm reflecting on what's possible for myself. Is that a good distinction? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that, that's right. That's right. I mean, we would expect a career conversation to be more driven by the interests of the young person. Yes. Okay, great. I think that's a great delineation and helpful for people trying to implement different strategies. So let's pivot to experience here. Um, I think that a lot of not just thinking about high school and post secondary, but in, in our workforce development uh, system here right now, there is a ton of talk about upskilling, which I'm, I'm sure you've heard that term of art. Um, and it's really targeting the notion that 
if people need to secure living wage or better jobs, they need to be reskilled or upskilled to be prepared for those jobs. Mm -hmm. And that, that notion, I would say in this US context, takes up a lot of the conversation about what ex what work experience looks like, right? That you actually are gaining the skills and experiences to then up level in your career. But I wanna just take a step back and maybe hear from you again with this lens of social capital in addition to the other upsides of work experiences, like what did you find makes for good work experience so that we're not just sort of creating, manufacturing work experience that wouldn't pay the dividends that the research suggested it ought to. Sure. sure. Um... Just, just on your first point about upskilling and 21st century skills and so on, um, something, something which we did find in our analysis, which is, which is super interesting, is that um, if, if a young person has volunteered, if they have worked part time um, or if they've done an internship or, or kind of like work placement within their schooling, we find that they're much more likely to agree that they're able to adapt to new circumstances mm. and to be a, kind of to be effective, personally effective in new situations. And adaptability is is kind of one of the key mm. things of you know the 21st century. We expect all these jobs to disappear, new jobs to arrive. You know, continually having to change. It's the life of jobs rather than the job for life. And you know, it's actually you know how do we teach adaptability? And you know what we find is that you know by having the experience where you're um, required to be personally effective in an unfamiliar situation that you actually become it, you know, you become more yeah. confident. And I think so it's that, immersive. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, know, that's sort of that sense of, uh, you know, a sense of some sort of control and confidence as being, mm -hmm. you know, being able to, you know, to be, to, 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 to be effective in these unusual situations. And so, I mean, I think that's really, I mean, that's one of the most, that's one of the most important findings, I think, which came out of, came out of this work. Now, um, on the question about, you know, what, what's good, um, we found, um, um, you know, across these four, three areas that, you know, there's a whole host of literature, um, particularly on volunteering in the last three years, there's been some, mm. some really important studies. Um, Meaning from a student who is volunteering. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so, I mean, one particularly in the US has looked at um, whether the, 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 the teenagers um, were required to volunteer or they chose to volunteer. Mm. I kind of find that, you know, the dividend they get, the benefit they get in work is the same. And so something mm. could be happening in the experience. Now, um, I think there's a couple of things there is that um, one is that, you know, kind of going back to this idea of critical thinkers, you yeah. know, when young people sort of, like, you know, kind of have opportunity to get exposed to the labor market, we want to be thinking about, you know, what's happening to them, you know, how this workplace is, is constructed, how people yes. get jobs. Um, you know, what they do, you know, how, you know, do they get on, you know, whether if you start here, where you might end up, you know, all those sort of, you know, you know, all, all those kind of like important questions, which are just sometimes quite difficult, you know, to, you know, to, to expose the truths of if, you know, if you're doing very traditional placement. And so yep. I think, I think we need to think about two sorts of placements. There's a placement where, you know, you're actually doing the job, which is um, very similar to a job which somebody else is getting paid to do. Yeah. You know? And so often like in apprenticeships um, or, um, you know, um, in the, you know, particularly in, kind of in the olden days, but still today, there's lots of jobs where take on sort of like teenagers and, you know, we want to give people, you know, opp opportunity to do the tasks, to show yep. they can do the tasks, to get to know sort of like their managers, get to know their employers, to be able to develop a reference to, you know, to, you know, to get experience, which is, you know, which, which will show a future employer that they're not taking a crazy gamble by giving this yep. person you know, like a chance. And then there is also kind of like a sense of uh, these work placements which is around um, job exploration. Mm -hmm. And so a lot, of, a lot of workplaces now, you know, they don't really have many jobs for, you know, kind of 17 year olds, yeah. know, maybe 20 year olds, some places, you know, and, and in which case, you know, what we want young people to be to do is to be able to explore a workplace and to be able to understand whether, you know, how it works, whether it's right for them, you know, sort of like, you know, you know um, you know where it might where it might take them, and that yeah. process of exploration is often it's often it's often best done through job shadowing. Sometimes yeah. with small groups of two or three students, you know, equip them to ask questions, get them to think about you know their experience beforehand, applies to both groups and afterwards. You know, filling in logs is important because it's it actually prompts them to you know kind of think and recall Reflect. their ideas. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm and I'm I'm really impressed. In, in the US, there's a, uh, there's there's a in New York at Gutman College, which you may be aware yeah. of, the Ethnographies of Work program. 
and it's aimed at you know the kids are 18 and over because they're they're, they're in um, community college but i think that's a brilliant program a brilliant idea yeah and we'll link to that on the blog but it's um a wonderful program within the cuny system at gutman college um and so i'm hearing about giving that at, at secondary school at high school as well you know doing yeah, similar things agree. and they do in some countries in finland for example you know they, they really and in new zealand they really try and get kids to think about you know work and, and what it is and in this area of era precarious work and yeah. where it's very easy to get trapped in low paid you know kind of you know unpleasant work we need to be able to you know give kids the tools to be able to navigate this difficult labor market yeah i don't know if you meant to frame it this way but one thing i'm hearing is you contrast these sort of two sorts of placements one that's sort of task focused and the other that's a little more exploration focused you know the task focused one to your point is de-risking the downstream sort of uh employer implications of hiring this candidate, but the exploration piece is de-risking for a young person, where am I gonna put my time and energy um, to give them a chance to sort of try before they buy on careers. And I think we constantly in systems design have to pay attention to both sides of that equation. How are you mitigating employer risk, but how are you also mitigating individual student, student risk? Um, I want to wrap up here, Anthony, with a uh, maybe a provocation. Although based on everything you said, I'm not think I don't think this is going to provoke you so much. Um, but I, I have been increasingly, and this is based on sort of how a, a history in the U.S. Uh, I think of some career readiness programs being amounting to tracking programs, amounting to sort of putting students on the path to a very specific job. Um, and the consequence of that being that you may actually be foreclosing options prematurely for that student. And so uh, I urge people often, again, through this lens of social networks being an asset in the opportunity equation to think not just about career readiness, but career optionality. What are the things that our schools can be doing to expand students' long-term options, not just the likelihood that they get a specific job, um, and I'm just curious, you know, when what what you found in the research when it comes to what are the things schools can do to expand student sense of many future future possible selves, as opposed to sort of like decide what your possible self is and run straight towards it and close doors along the way. I don't know if that question makes sense, but I just I worry when readiness is code for fewer options rather than more options. Yeah. Um, no, that's, it's a really good question. Um, and, you know, for us, career readiness is about equipping the young people with the ability to become critical thinkers about mm -hmm. themselves and their potential role in the labor. A bunch. Yeah. Um, broadening, you know, kind of broadening career aspirations is just as important as, as raising them. You know, kids already mm. have really high aspirations. You know, this mm. is, you know, we, we know this from PISA, but this is probably, you know, the most ambitious generation of all time. It's also mm -hmm. ultimately the most highly qualified generation of all time, which makes it particularly tragic um, that they are now struggling and will struggle so much in the labour market. Um, but for, you know, you know, you know, we, we, what we can find out from PISA is that you know we've got um, you know very able kids, you know, from very disadvantaged backgrounds, who um, have you know, kind of very um, distorted views about what their future might be. You know, so we find that idea about career misalignment. We find that much more likely if you're from a, a working class background. Um, we find that um, you know young people's interest in vocational education and training, or CTE in, in the US, is very much distorted by whether you live in um, a city or in the countryside. Um, if you're a migrant or if you're a native born, if you're a boy or a girl, you know. So we kind of find that you know that there are. You know, there are sort of like almost some some inherent tracking, you know, some societal tracking functions which are going mm. on. And for schools, you know, they need to kind of like recognize that, you know, they do have a, a kind of like a responsibility to intervene, you know, to be the kind of the democratic structure, which mm. will expose young people to an, a broader range of possibilities and to encourage them and enable them to kind of develop the kind of the networks to develop the you know the experience which ultimately gives them a sense of you know kind of confident agency as they go through you know their life we want them to go through with choices and want them to go through with confidence yeah. and want to be informed and i should just finish off by saying that you know this is this is the start for us so we kind of published this paper in december um we kind of say we kind of published a summary um um you know um just the end of last month but we'll we're doing new analysis you know, including right. our um, data in the United States, um, we're going to publish more on what the data has to say um, about, you know, what are the interventions which seem to really make, which we make a yes. difference. 
you know, kind of later on. And we're not saying you should do this program or that program, but we're saying right. that successful programs, if they, you know, if they have, you know, if they change these elements about thinking, experiencing, exploring, you can have confidence that they're going to, yes. you know, that they, they're, they're much more likely to have an, you know, a strong, meaningful impact upon the kind of the life chances of a young person. And so, you know, you know, watch this space. And in October, you know, we're going to have a series of data-driven tools in kind of for right. where we, we look at these indicators from longitudinal data and we turn them into kind of questionnaires and resources, which um, which teachers and policymakers, you know, can use yeah. to get a sense about, you know, where they are and where their students are and, and to measure the, the, the change, which we, we hope we'll see. Yeah, I'll just say, Anthony, again, I really appreciate the framing you've brought to all of this because you can do a lit review that is um, deeply impractical and you've taken this in the opposite direction of thinking about the, pra the practical implications of what the research tells us. And I think where I'm most optimistic here in the US context is a lot of effort and will and dollars are going into this already. And to your point, it's almost that you can, you guys are creating a, a framework and a set of tools that you can audit what you're doing and make adjustments based on what the research says to have the, the greatest possible outcomes for, for young people. Um, it's just really inspiring um, way to do research. So I commend you for that. So uh, just to summarize, I think on this notion of optionality, I heard a lot around agency critical thinking and adaptability as some of the um, lasting outcomes that exploration and experience can create for young people um, to again, prepare them for like a future that we can't predict, which I think is a messy reality to confront, but it's a way to de-risk that for young people. Um, I'll be linking to all of your papers. And as you come out with new stuff, we'll add them to this blog so people have a reference point. Anthony, thank you for taking the time. Anthony didn't share this, but he has a new puppy who stayed quite quiet this <laughs> entire time. So um, thanks for yeah. that. Thanks to the pup and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Julia. Okay, I'm going to stop recording.